Hello, I am Matt McIntosh with Vallejo Bible College, and welcome to this edition of In the Classroom. We are so happy to have you with us today. We hope that you're having a great day, and I trust that the blessings of the Lord have been on you today, and uh, we're just enjoying the goodness of God. Uh, every day, He just enriches our lives and blesses us in such a mighty way, and I'm just honored to be able to to share his blessings with you today in this lesson. Today we're going to be discussing Christ's inner circle. So before we get into the lesson, we're gonna have a word of prayer and then we'll get started. And Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for this opportunity to learn today and to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We ask you please to enlighten the eyes of our understanding and help us to grow wiser in you. And we ask this in Jesus' mighty name and amen. And amen. Praise God. Now, when reading the Gospels, one can't help but notice that there must have been something different, something special, something attractive to the Lord Jesus Christ regarding three of his 12 disciples, namely Peter, James, and John. Now, we conclude this by the fact that he gave them exclusive access into events that the other disciples were simply not privy to. Uh, the scriptures are silent as to a straightforward reason why this was, but we can speculate from the sacred text as to why this may have been. Uh, the goal of this lesson is to examine the characteristics of these men um, in relation to the exception that Jesus made to them and hopes of gaining a better understanding of what constituted Christ's inner circle. Now, why is that important to us? Well, because it should be the desire of every Christian to be as close to Christ as they can possibly be, because that's what our salvation is. It's a relationship. And when it comes to our relationship with God, we want it to be as close as we can make it. Um, when you consider that Jesus had 12 disciples and yet he gave special consideration to three of those 12, it certainly explains how there are countless Christians in the world today, uh, yet there always seems to be an elect few who have that special understanding, who have that special closeness with God that other Christians don't generally have. Um, if there remains an inner circle with Christ that we can be a part of, then let's strive to be a part of that inner circle. Amen. And it'll be the search for the understanding of this mystery that's going to, the, that's going to the embody the essence of this lesson. And certainly the journey itself, I believe, will be as rewarding as the destination. Praise the Lord. So I believe the best place to begin is to look at the specific places in Scripture where these three men are called out by name and examine those events and find and extrapolate the truths that the Bible is telling us, that the Word of God is giving us to get a better understanding of why these men were in his inner circle. Now, there are four major places in the gospel where these three men are noted in particular. Now, the first place we're going to look at is Mark chapter 5, verses 35 through 43. And for the sake of time, I'm going to forego the reading of that text. However, we will look at the facts of the text. Um, this, this involved the raising of Jairus' daughter from the dead. Now, to give you a quick backdrop on the story, Jesus was approached, said, hey, I need you to come and heal my daughter. She is sick unto death. And Jesus, en route to heal her, gets the news that the maid has died. Upon hearing this news, Jesus announces to the crowd that the damsel was not dead, but slept and was laughed to scorn from all that followed him when he made this announcement. He said, she's not sleeping, or rather, he, she is not dead, but she sleeps. And when he said this, the Bible says that he was laughed to scorn. Um, 
Upon entering into her house, he puts them all out, all of the naysayers, all of the doubters. He puts them all out and he leaves five people to witness this miracle. The maid's parents and Peter, James, and John. Now, with the raising of Jairus' daughter, they were witness to one of his greatest divine miracles because he pronounces life upon this young maid and she literally rises from the dead. She who was dead, just as Jesus said, she wasn't dead, she slept. And that was, that was Jesus' way of saying that he was going to raise her from the dead. And he raises her from the dead and they were witness to this great miracle. Now, it is true that many of the disciples and many others saw Jesus raise others from the dead. That's, that is a biblical fact. But this particular miracle, only James and John and Peter were, witness, were witnesses of, aside from the other disciples that did not see it. Only these three men saw this miracle. And the point I want to make about this particular event is the fact that it was Christ's inner circle that witnessed a miracle that other disciples did not witness. And this was, this was purposely done by Christ. Christ purposely allowed these three men only to see this miracle. Now, how does that affect our lives as Christians? Because when you're a part of of Christ's inner circle. You are going to witness miracles that other Christians simply will not witness. And I'm sure that there are some of you who are watching this right now and, and you know what I'm and you know what I'm talking about because you've seen things. You've seen God heal. You've seen God do amazing things that other people didn't get to see. And I believe a lot of the reasons that we get to see some of the things that God allows us to is because of our desire to be close to God, our desire to be a part of that inner circle, that, that close relationship. Because we're talking about three men who had a closer relationship recorded in the Bible with the Lord than anyone else. As far as the scripture is concerned, these men had something with the Lord that no one else had. And as Christians, we should strive for that as well, because when we strive for that, we're going to see things that other Christians aren't going to see. And I want that in my life. And we, I, I, think, I think Christians should desire that, to, to see the mighty works of God firsthand, because they are there to be seen. God, God isn't hiding his power. His, his power is just as effective today as it's always been. And when you're in Christ's inner circle, that power is so, it, 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 it's, it's a testimony to our life because as we witness miracles happen, as some of you may be a miracle, some of you may have experienced God's miracle working power. I know I have personally, I have experienced his miracle working power myself. These are testimonies. These are the things that win souls. These are the things that give people comfort. These are the things that help other Christians when they're struggling with things. So miracles are a powerful tool in the life of a Christian. And when Christ allows you to witness miracles that others may not have got to see, what it does is it equips you to become a fabulous testimony for the kingdom of God. Amen. Just a great testimony for God's kingdom. Now, the second event we want to talk about is the Olivet Discourse. And this can be found in Mark chapter 13. In fact, I'm going to read a couple of verses for you uh, regarding this. This is Mark 13, verse 3 and verse 4. And the Bible says this. It says, As he sat upon the Mount of Olives over against the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign when all these things shall be fulfilled? Here the three disciples, along with Andrew, they privately ask Jesus regarding the end of the world. Now, what follows is one of the master's most profound prophecies in all of Scripture regarding major events that are yet to come. 
and only these men were given this information. Now, one could object here and say this prophecy is now common knowledge to everybody. Well, that's true. It is. But while that may hold true now, it was much different at the time it was given. Nobody else was asking for this miracle. Nobody else was asking for this information. Nobody else was seeking God regarding this type of revelation. And it's very important to note that it was only these select men that were doing the inquiry. So the fact that they were asking and the fact that they went to Christ privately gave them insight that other disciples did not have. Now, this event stands out because it demonstrates their confidence in Christ's omniscience that the other disciples were simply not demonstrating. It wasn't that the other nine, it wasn't that the other eight didn't have that belief and that faith in Christ for his omniscience. It simply was that they were not dis demonstrating it like Peter, James, and John were, along with Andrew in this case. And the point I want to bring out from this is that this could be a major contributing factor as to what constituted Christ's inner circle. Because these men went to Jesus privately to ask him this. And that's a big deal. That's a big deal because any Christian can commend himself to God publicly. Uh, anybody can go to church and, and play the part and put on the suit. Anybody can be publicly for God, especially when the crowd is gathered and, and you have the opportunity to show yourself a Christian while people are looking, because plenty of people do that. But it's a different kind of Christian altogether that seeks their Lord privately, like these four men did. That's why I can't stress the point of this text enough that they sought the Lord privately. This is not something that every Christian today does. We have Christians that will only pray when they're in church, that will only seek God when they're in church, or perhaps even worse, the only time they have anything to do with God is when they're at church or when they're at a gathering. And I, want to, I say this because I want to challenge you as Christians. Your relationship with Christ should transcend the house of God. It should be in your own home. It should be at your job. It should be everywhere you go because our relationship with the Lord is 24-7. And we should be striving to have that relationship with him, especially privately, because it's during those it's during those private times with the Lord that the deepest revelations come. It's during those private times with the Lord that you hear his voice with more clarity than you hear it anywhere else. Because when the Lord sees that you are interested in him in a private way, that's when you really, really start to hear from God. And that's why, this, that's why this event is so important because of what it teaches us. These men had a revelation that nobody else had. And if we want to get revelations like that from God, we need to have a private relationship with him. We need to have a relationship that transcends church, that transcends anything public. Because it's, it's the closest relationships that are always the most private. And that's what, de that's what the Lord desires to have with us is that closeness, that intimacy, that privacy, that only Christ's inner circle are going to experience. Amen. We're going to take a short break, but we're going to come right back. Don't go anywhere. There's still two major events I want to cover, and we're going to close this thing up. Come right back.
All right, and welcome back to In the Classroom. We are, are currently studying Christ's inner circle, and we are looking over four major events regarding Peter, James, and John, and we're about to hit event number three. This is a major significant event that is recorded in Matthew chapter 17, verse 1, and we know this as the Mount of Transfiguration. And if you're a Bible reader, I know you'll be familiar with this event. It's a very significant event in, this, in the Gospels. And it regards Peter, James, and John in a significant way because they were invited to see something that was absolutely magnificent that has only been seen by these three men. And what happens is Jesus brings these men into a high mountain apart. Uh, meaning it was just Christ and these three disciples. And the Bible says that when they were alone, that he was transfigured before them. And what that means is the Bible described it as saying that his face shined like the sun and his clothing was white as the light. Now, when we read of Christ and his eternal glory, this is the description that we have. When you, when you read the, description, the descriptions in Revelation and, and things of that nature, Christ is described as light. And, uh, the Lamb is the light thereof in that great city. And what they see on the Mount of Transfiguration is that eternal glory that Christ demonstrates. His face shining like the sun, his clothing white as the light. And not only that, these men saw Moses and Elijah on the mount as well, speaking with Jesus. And to top it all off, they even actually heard the voice of the Father himself from heaven, saying, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And all of this points to the fact that Christ's inner circle, Peter, James, and John, got to witness the glory of God like no disciple had ever seen. And that's the point I want to make regarding this particular event, because the revelation regards the glory of God, which is manifested in his inner circle, much more so than with all of his disciples. Now, 2 Corinthians 4.15 says this, it says, for all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. Our lives are, as Christians are meant to manifest God's glory. Not our glory, but God's. And we're talking about powerful elements that manifest his glory. Things like victory. Things like authority over the devil. Uh, authority over sin, uh, power, love, sound mind, like Paul described to Timothy. These are elements that manifest the glory of God. Consistency, persistency, the fact that we don't give up no matter what comes our way, that when we're in the, in the deepest and the darkest storms of life, that even then we are more than conquerors. That when the devil is fighting us tooth and nail, we are more than conquerors. That is how the glory of God is manifest in our lives. This is what draws people to want what we have when they see the glory of God in our lives. And that's, that's what makes this event so significant that he would take his inner circle with him because they saw that glory. They, they were partakers of that. They saw the glory of God manifested in their lives. And as Christ's inner circle that's what we should strive for as well, that the glory of God be manifested in, in our lives, that, that God's glory can shine forth through us, that he can get the praise, that he can get the glory, that he gets the honor through the lives that we live by the enabling power of his spirit. And as Christians, I've said it before, but it, it's such an important point to make. The spirit of God that, that is given to us by, by the salvation through his blood, that enabling power of the spirit is so important. And it's not something that we should ever take for granted. 
But we understand as Christians that we have the power through Christ to do all things. And that should never be ignored and it should never be taken for granted. And this event exemplifies what it means to have the glory of God in our lives. And we should strive that God's glory be made manifest. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now we're going to look at the fourth and final event, which I want to read to you from Mark chapter 14. This is verses 32 and 34. And this is the depiction of the Garden of Gethsemane and Christ's agony in the garden. And these are very significant scriptures. And the Bible says this in Mark 14, 32, it says, And they came to a place which was named Gethsemane. And he saith to his disciples, Sit ye here while I shall pray. And he taketh with him Peter and James and John, and began to be sore amazed and to be very heavy. And saith unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. Now, we're talking right now about the greatest agony that any human being ever went through in the history of mankind. Christ suffered this agony in this event. This was the agony of agonies. Christ was in agony not because he was afraid to go to the cross, not because he was afraid of the pain that he was about to endure, not because he was afraid of dying. He understood that he was going to do all of that. that that's why he came. His agony was because he knew the hour had come that he must become sin for us. He must become the one thing that he was not and could and he, he was the opposite of everything sinful. He is righteousness. He is holiness. And now he must become sin for us. And in so doing, become separated from the Father for our sakes. I don't think any one of us can ever truly grasp what the severity was that he had to endure. In fact, the book of Luke, I believe, even says that his sweat became even, as it were, drops of blood. This was the kind of agony that he was in, uh, in this event. But what I want us to take note of is the fact that when you think about the hardest times of our life, and you think about all of the things that, the deepest sorrows that we have to go through, and the deepest and the darkest tribulations that we have to endure, Generally, it's during those times that we only call upon those that are closest to us. I think, that's a, I think that's a fair statement. You generally will call upon your closest people in the times of your darkest trials. And in this agony of agonies, Christ took with him Peter and James and John, his inner circle. And this, to me, this event it depicts perhaps the most defining quality of Christ's inner circle because it was his inner circle who were the closest to Christ's sufferings. Now, let me be clear on this point because this is important. Not their sufferings, Christ's sufferings, okay? And applying to this, applying this to our lives as Christians, what this means is is that whenever you partake of any type of suffering for Christ, for the cause of Christ, or for the cause of the kingdom of God, these are not actually your sufferings. These are actually Christ's sufferings that you have been made a partaker of. And the Bible teaches this. The Bible gives us the certainty that this is true. Because Philippians 3.10 says that I might know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, not our sufferings, his sufferings, being made conformable to his death. And only those who are willing to partake of Christ's sufferings are going to reap the greatest relationship, they're going to reap the greatest rewards, and they're going to reap the greatest benefits. The Bible gives us the certainty. We read in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 5 and 7, it says, for as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, 
so also, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that you, as you are partakers of the sufferings, so ye shall be also of the consolation. First Peter 4.13 says, But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Romans 8.18 says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And 2 Timothy 2.12 says, If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. And what the word of God is telling us is that when we partake of Christ's sufferings, what is going to follow is going to be so rewarding and so much greater of a reward is going to follow than the sufferings we ever had to endure for the cause of Christ. That's why Paul says with such confidence, the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And I believe that's what every true Christian who is in that inner circle is going to experience is that consolation, that magnificent consolation, that magnificent glory that God is going to allow us to experience because we were willing to suffer, to partake of his sufferings. And that's why it's so important that we never give up, that we keep on fighting, and that we never lose sight of our goal which is our relationship with Jesus Christ. Because no matter how difficult life may be, no matter what the devil throws at us, it is that relationship. It is because we are in that inner circle and that have that closeness with our Lord. That's the thing that's going to make us more than conquerors. That's what's going to give us the victory and, and the peace that passes all understanding through those darkest times. To be a partaker of Christ's sufferings is to reap one of the greatest blessings that the Lord could bestow upon us. Amen. In closing, let me say this, because many Christians, I'm sure, don't consider themselves to be in the same league with these men, Peter, James, and John. And that's understandable. That's, that's, that's a reasonable thought, because you're talking about men who walked with him and talked with him, the incarnate Christ, they, they saw what he did. They heard what he said. That, that is hard to compete with, I will admit. But you've got to remember, Peter, James, and John were just as human as we were, as we are. They have qualities that are both commendable and objectionable. And when you think of Peter, you know, you have to remember he was constantly speaking and acting before he thought. And his hasty spirit often got him into trouble. But it was always because of the zeal that he had for his Lord. And Peter, of all people, ends up preaching the church's very first sermon in the book of Acts chapter 2. And in that very first sermon, the Bible says that 3,000 souls were saved. Now, this from the man who sank in the water. This from the man that Jesus rebuked and said, get thee behind me, Satan. This, this same man preaches the church's first sermon and 3,000 souls are saved. Consider James. Along with his brother John, they were presumptuous regarding their place in heaven. You can find that in Mark 10, 35. In Luke 9, 54, these men were ready to call down fire on the Samaritans. That don't sound too much like a Christian, does it? But you have to remember, they were as human as we are. Uh, James grew in grace. He became very prominent. And it was James who became the first apostle to be martyred, meaning he gave his life for the cause of Jesus Christ. Now, when you look at that on a spiritual, on a spiritual term, as living sacrifices, it is our duty as Christians to give our life for the cause of the gospel as well, for the cause of Jesus Christ. And that's what we should be doing. We should be giving our life for the cause of the gospel as living sacrifices. And that's what's so great about being saved. That's what's so great about being a disciple of Christ because our lives mean something. Our lives have 
worth. Because you're a child of God, your life has so much value. And this, this is why Christ died. He died for sinners because he so loved the world, because God so loved the world. That is the value that God places on all of us. Even in our lost estate, God placed that value on us because God saw our worth. And as Christians and as living sacrifices, that worth can be manifested to the glory of God. Praise his holy name. And then you look at John. The point I want to make about John is the fact that he was the one who was leaning on Jesus' breast when Jesus announced that one of them would betray him. And he was the only one of the disciples that was ever recorded who literally heard the heartbeat of Almighty God. He was the only one recorded that heard the heartbeat of God. And all of this because he was willing to get as close to his Lord as was humanly possible. That's what constitutes Christ in a circle because of the willingness to be as close to our Lord as we can possibly be. And this was what Christ saw in these three men. Sure, he knew they were, he knew they were only human. He knew they were going to make mistakes. But he saw in them that desire that they had to want to please their Lord and to be close to him. And, and that desire they had to have that close relationship with him. Now, maybe you've made a lot of mistakes in your walk with God as well. Maybe, maybe you stumbled and struggled and, and been hasty in your spirit and done things you shouldn't have done. And maybe you've had to been be rebuked by the Lord a few good times yourself. I know, I'm sure we all have. I know I have. But if you think about it, you're just quite a lot like Peter because that's exactly how Peter was. So maybe you've misappropriated your understanding of biblical truths. Maybe you've, you know, been presumptuous in your walk with God. But but like Peter, your heart's always been in the right place. You've cultivated your wisdom. You've cultivated your understanding. Because if that's the case, you're just like James. And then maybe you've just had a desire to be as close to God as you can possibly get. That you would desire to hear the very heartbeat of God. Well, if that's the case, you're quite a lot like John. So you see, there's, there's not much difference between us. The only thing that is hindering you from being a part of Christ's inner circle is yourself. You are your only hindrance because if you want that, if you want that closeness, it's yours for the taking. If you want to hear the heart of God and you want to know the revelations and you want to have the understanding that these men had, if you want to see the glory manifested the glory of God manifested in your life and to have that victory and to, and to be able to, to be able to minister to people and to, and to help win souls. All you've got to do is seek the Lord the way these men sought him. Christ is no respecter of persons. We have this certainty in the word of God. God is no respecter of persons. If these men had that closeness, then we can have it too. And when Christ is the top priority of your life, why wouldn't we be a part of his inner circle also? Amen and amen. Thank you for watching this edition of In the Classroom. I hope this has enriched your understanding of the Word of God. And I pray God's richest blessings be upon you. And I pray that we can all grow in the knowledge and the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You can view this episode and others on our YouTube channel. And until next time, may the blessings of Almighty God always be with you. God bless.